Um, hi everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, first webinar on uh, uh, circular economy. So uh, today the session will be um, will, will be uh, the training will be done by Alex Alexandre Lemille, who is uh, one of the co-founder of uh, ASEN and uh, is also the founder of Wise Impact, um, which is a consulting um, firm. Um, who has developed uh, this circular economy, um, um, replacing human, human at the center of it, called a circular economy uh, 2.0. So um, now I, and I hand over to Alex, who will do the, um, the training. So, um, yes, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Muriel. Um, let me share uh, the presentation. So, so I'm Alex Lemil. I uh, had the opportunity to co-found the uh, African Circular Economy Network uh, two, two and a half years ago uh, when, uh, when I was in South Africa and uh, I'm very happy to host you today. Um, we will have a, a review of what circular economy is about, uh, where it comes from, and how applicable it could be uh, to, to Africa. So basically there will be uh, three sessions of 40 minutes. Uh, the first session is this one, then we will be back to, back to the second session. And the third session will be dedicated to uh, questions and answers. So introduction to the, to the circular economy. Um, and as, as Marianne mentioned, Wise Impact is uh, the consulting company I founded. Um, so we will review the, uh, the current linear economy, uh, what, what it means uh, to be in a linear economy, which is the current uh, model we are in. Um, what is circular economy about, the definition and its principles. Then we will go through a few examples and uh, later on at the end we will ask ourselves why Africa and uh, we, will, uh, we will be discussing on, on, on that topic. And, and also what, it, what circular economy uh, should be addressing uh, for the needs of African people. So that's going to be the third session. So what is the, the current linear economy? Basically, um, it's what we've realized late, as of late, uh, that it's a wrongly uh, designed system. Uh, it's a system that leads to uh, scarcity, all kinds of scarcity, starting with uh, resource scarcity and uh, pure air and pure uh, environmental system scarcity. And uh, this scarcity will have to be, to, to be shifted uh, to a more responsible model uh, in order to address the needs of, of the people on this planet. So the linear economy starts with what we call the tech. So it's the extractive phase uh, of our industrial activity. So we extract resources from the ground. So that's, that extractive activity is, is huge in Africa. Um, then once we've extracted the resources of the ground, we uh, transform uh, those, those primary resources, raw material, into uh, products, products that we will uh, consume. And these products are meant uh, without what we call the environmental externalities, is that we make them because they look good, because they are highly performing. Uh, but we want we don't uh, embed uh, the impact on societies and, and the environment at this stage. Once we make those products, um, we consume them as consumers. Uh, so by consuming them, we mean we use them a uh, few times the first six months. And after six months, we uh, kind of drop them uh, in the landfill or in the bin. Uh, because they are meant to uh, based on they are designed based on what we call the uh, uh, obsolescence uh, obsolescence meaning that these products are meant to last uh, one two three years before they they die of its uh, themselves. 
And then once you consume them, we waste them. Therefore, we, we throw them to the landfill. Uh, landfill that are hidden from our eyes, but uh, they are more and more, it's more and more difficult to hide them uh, away from our urban centers. So this is what we call the, the, the linear uh, economic system, the linear strategy, the tech make waste. Uh, the issue with that model is that it generates lots of waste, uh, lots of energy, requires lots of labor, and lots of investments. Uh, the R here means uh, rent. That was a presentation done for South Africa. Um, so basically, uh, the, the, the wider the arrow, uh, the bigger the impact on waste generation, energy uh, needs, and labor needs, as well as investment needs. At the bottom, in, in blue and uh, brown, you see the the soil and the, the, the oceans. So the waste goes to, uh, to, to either the soil or the underground or the ocean. So the same goes for the make phase. Lots of waste, lots of energy, lots of labor applied, lots of investment. And finally, at the end uh, of the process, uh, again, lots of waste generated in landfills. Uh, residual energy, when you drop your mobile phone into the landfill, Obviously, there is a lot of energy embedded in the mobile phone, lots of uh, research and development hours that are being, being wasted, lots of uh, human energy wasted and investment, financial investment. So, so all in all, when you look at this linear model, it's a lot about waste and wastage of everything, of material, of human knowledge, of uh, research and development, of financial uh, investment. And this is what I meant by uh, leading us to uh, scarcity at, at many levels, because we are, uh, by, by, by generating so much waste, we decrease the functions of our environment, we pollute uh, the soil, the air, and the oceans, and we lead to, uh, uh, not being able to address the needs of the people in a, in a, in a planet uh, leading to 9.7 billion people. So we have a problem with this model and uh, uh, the solution would be uh, discussed in a minute. The linear economy is also what we call the function of, uh, based on the function of throughputs. Uh, the more you produce, the more you need to produce. Uh, this is based on the um, on the lowering the cost of production. Uh, so just to give you an idea, you all have in mind these pictures of uh, car manufacturing plants, uh, outside parking with all these cars being produced. You have thousands of cars outside laying on the parking under the sun. Um, and this is meant to be uh, the economies of, to reach the economies of scale. So the more we produce, the more the parts, the less the parts are costly. So the function of throughputs. Um, and there is another aspect which is going to be shown now in this slide is that uh, you have the car manufacturer. If we take the example of the, the car here, uh, the car manufacturer owns the, the, the car, uh, the building of the car, the creation of the car. Uh, but once the car manufacturer is done with the, uh, with the car preparation uh, and manufacture, it sells the car uh, to the purchaser. But at the same time of selling the car to the purchaser, the legal uh, responsibility moved to you and me as a, as a customer. So, so that, that, that legal responsibility as well as the investment and uh, all the waste streams that go with it uh, move to, to us as customers. Then once we, are, we want to get rid of the car, uh, either we, hopefully we sell it on the second hand market, but at the end, it, it goes into the hands of the authorities. So the, your local government, uh, country leads, um, and all the investment and the legal responsibilities uh, move to them. Uh, and the authorities, they need to find a way to uh, address all the waste streams that this car will lead to 
the legal responsibility grows as, uh, as the car moves from one responsible authority to another. And obviously, uh, our government uh, needs to find a way to finance the retreatment of these many waste streams uh, at the end of the car uh, life cycle. And therefore, um, and, and that car on top of that uh, leads to generate a lot of externalities. And I mentioned that, that, that word earlier on. Externalities are in circular economy considered to be uh, environmental externalities. Uh, in the model I suggest, circular economy 2.0, I, I, I suggest to add social externalities on top, but here let's stick to uh, circular economy, the, the main uh, framework. So basically this car uh, would lead to many types of externalities, all these impacts that the car manufacturer did not account for when creating such a car. And basically they are traffic congestion, air pollution, health impact, noise, death, injuries uh, on to the people, uh, multiple kinds of waste, uh, chemical hazard, uh, hazardous waste uh, that needs to be retreated. And the car manufacturer is not responsible for, for these uh, waste streams and uh, negative externalities. Therefore, the government has to find a way to finance uh, all, these, all these issues. And uh, usually the taxpayer, i.e. us, uh, is there to, to, to pay for the bill. Therefore, it's a model where we once pay for the car as a purchaser, as a customer, and we pay for the car a second time uh, in the retreatment of, of those many ways in addressing the air pollution of our cities, in addressing the death and injury. So we need hospitals and clinics uh, to, 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 to cure the people. So uh, as you can see, uh, this, this model becomes, uh, works on its head, as we say, uh, as, as, as the population grows and it's unbearable as we speak. So we have to find a way to, uh, to address these many issues. Another aspect of our current uh, economy is that uh, we, the global economy, uh, all together, all five continents, uh, generates uh, approximately $3.2 trillion uh, um, in revenues. And what, what, what is the percentage that we waste out of this $3.2 trillion uh, in value? Well, we waste an horrendous uh, 80% of these amount. So 2.7 trillion that we drop basically in the bin. So uh, this is a bit shocking when you look at that. Uh, and uh, we can no longer uh, follow such a, such a wasting uh, model. Uh, one of the last aspects I wanted to address, uh, there's maybe one or two more uh, left, but in a linear economy, uh, this is mainly about resource management and granting access to resources to factories and to countries that need those resources to, to address the needs of their people. And if you take the, this is, this is somehow the, 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 the world uh, history uh, in the past 100 years, um, and the financial market and how the financial market in terms of raw materials, this is based on four commodities here, uh, food, non-food, agricultural items, metal and energy. But basically, uh, the more we produce, the more we extracted uh, raw material in the 20th century, uh, the better, because the, the cost of this raw material decreased by 1.2% over the past 100 years. Uh, even though uh, throughout the, the, the World War II, one, World War II, and even the oil shock of the 70s. So it made sense to extract as many resources as possible. It makes sense to go for a function of throughput. The more we produce, the more, the more we need volumes and the better for the, uh, uh, for the, for the, for the lowering the cost of production. Um, but basically, since the early 2000, uh, the financial market on raw materials not only went high and with highs and downs, but also uh, was uh, very volatile. 
So we do, do not know how to expect uh, what would be the price of the raw material we need uh, tomorrow. So basically, it's super volatile and uh, the price, uh, we, we don't know what to expect. And that's what we call the super cycle uh, and financial crisis. So there, there is more and more financial crisis to, to expect because of the pressure uh, on the financial market and because of the access to, uh, to these resources. And uh, the question mark here is uh, what to expect next because now Africa is uh, moving into the industrial uh, revolution full speed. Uh, it was uh, the case of India uh, back in, uh, in the late 90s, the case of China's uh, earlier on. Um, and there is more and more pressure on these resources and therefore more and more pressure on the financial market. So another aspect of moving for companies moving to a circular economy is to protect themselves from the financial market, which is difficult to, uh, to, to, to know uh, what to expect in terms of, uh, of prices uh, for raw materials. Obviously, one of the aspects is the population growth. The last uh, estimates is 9.7 billion uh, uh, people by uh, 2050. It's not so much a matter of how many people on the planet uh, will we be. I mean, we could be 13 billion people uh, if we all access resources in a, in a responsible way. So, so how, but if we do not waste that much, as much as we do uh, in the current linear economy, if we all circulate goods uh, so that they can be uh, reused and accessed and shared differently, we could be 13 billion people. It, it's, it, not really, it does not really matter. The issue we have is that uh, it's about the middle class, i.e. you and me, um, having a car, having a house, having... Uh, obviously, it's not always the reality in Africa. I, I understand that. But, but the, the gray block that you see here is China, India, Latin America, Africa, moving into uh, the middle class uh, as we speak, because it has started already. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 we are in this at the beginning of this gray, uh, gray, gray block, and that's more about the intensity of the pressure on resources that this middle class uh, have been uh, put in, put it put in the on the pressure of resources from Europe, America in the past, and it's growing in Europe and America, now together with China, Africa, uh, India, and Latin America. So we, we have to take this into account and to address this middle class so that they, uh, they circle resources longer and access resources differently. Uh, and you see the next decade expectation. The issue, the issue we have is this exponential model of consumption uh, that will increase the pressure on resources by, by, by two at a minimum. So it's more about the intensity of use of materials and the exponential model that we fear than uh, being, being 10 billion people on the planet. So what is the circular economy? Well, what is before we understand what circular economy is all about and based on what I just explained, uh, what's the ultimate goal of a new economic model. Uh, and basically you see here the, the relationship between uh, um, the, the resource use, so in, term, in, in terms per, per capita, in terms, in terms per person. So basically how much resource do we use versus uh, how rich uh, the, our country is, so the GDP per capita. We can discuss GDP, but this is not the, this is not the session about today. Um, this is a wrong uh, indicator, but this is what we have today. So, and basically, you see the correlation line, the, the dotted red line uh, on, the, on the graph, uh, with the countries being allocated uh, alongside this line. And there is, there is this correlation, so there is a strong relationship between how much resource we use and how poor or rich we are in terms of countries' GDP. And you see that Africa is more uh, at the bottom of, of, this, uh, of these lines, uh, of this graph. Obviously, the, the poorest countries in Africa, the poorest countries in, 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 
in Asia, so Niger, Bangladesh, to name a few. Then we see India, then we move to uh, the richer countries in Africa, uh, Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt, uh, all these countries, Morocco, uh, Colombia, China, Brazil. Uh, this is a roughly, Brazil is often uh, at the same level as, as South Africa in terms of GDP. And then we see the European countries, uh, America, Australia, and uh, the last one on the top are usually the, the Middle Eastern countries. Middle Eastern countries, uh, obviously, uh, Saudi Arabia, Un United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. And, and, and this, this relationship needs to be broken. That's the objective of a circular economy. It is the objective of a circular economy is to, to make sure that this correlation line uh, becomes horizontal somehow in order to free some space, free access to resources to countries in Africa that needs to develop it themselves and release the pressure from the countries uh, in Europe, America, Australia, China, obviously, uh, so that we somehow grant access to most countries with uh, resources. So obviously, one of the points I often make is that there is, uh, on top of ac uh, accessing resources, we need to grant an equal access to those resources, otherwise the circular economy will not uh, function as, as expected. So this is the, the, the ultimate goal of such, a, such an economic model. I've got a short video, so I'm not sure if it uh, will work properly here, but let's try. Uh, maybe I should exit my screen, uh, because it's always better to listen to another way of uh, explaining what circular economy is and this video is doing a great job let me see i've got it on my on my computer anyway okay it's coming Peter, let me know if you don't see the video. No, we can't. Uh, we can't see it, uh, Alex. Yeah, it's coming. You, okay. you can't see the the, the YouTube uh, screen. No. Oh. Um. Okay. Let me see the video. Okay. Um, this is not the right one. Okay, maybe I suggest uh, I will send the the video. Uh, yeah. Yep. Let, let me try one once more. Uh, otherwise. Okay, I'm just starting the video which is on my computer. And just let you know, we're not going to be stopped. Um, Zoom has given us uh, an unlimited call, oh, so thank you, Zoom. we don't have to cut off at any. Oh, point. that's the gift uh, window. I just we've had a gift, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, if not, then uh, if it doesn't work, I'll try this end, and maybe later we can share. The... Oh, here we go. I think it's coming. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we can hear it. We can't hear much, though. So. You can't hear? No. Okay. Let's see, I think 
it's a bandwidth problem as much as anything. Perhaps if you put the link into the chat, then people can see it later. It's very good. Um, it's a very good video, well, well worth looking at. The sound's not coming through, Alex. Okay, okay so uh, we will put the, the link. Yeah, uh, I'll do that now. Okay, great. So a great video to, as a compliment to, to, to this presentation, to explain to you with other words, uh, the approach of uh, circular economy. But let me, um, let me continue the, the presentation. Just waiting for my screen to go through. Okay, so basically the, the circular economy, and this is not often said because a lot of uh, a lot of time we talk about circular economy as a waste management concept or a recycling concept, but this is not exactly what it is. So it's a great uh, great opportunity to to take some time to to explain what what it is exactly. So it's basically a a, a concept that based itself on the mimicking of natural cycles. Uh, so we look at nature and we understand how we will fit in the wider design of nature. And this is why it has such a success, uh, even though uh, the recycling activity takes a lot of space uh, in the discussions, but recycling is the last resort and I will explain that later on. But basically we look at natural cycles and we try to follow those cycles and understand uh, how nat nature works. And basically that's why we circulate uh, goods back into the economy. So we split the economy into two parts, uh, the technical sphere uh, or the technosphere, where we have the, the materials with the, the raw materials embedded. And we try to get to create some feedback loop uh, into our manufacturing system so that uh, the components uh, return to our factories and uh, manufacturing sites. And on the other hand, we have the biological system, the sphere, sorry, or the, the biosphere, uh, where we uh, access uh, biological uh, nutrients, so basically uh, food and non-food agricultural items. And we return, once we consume them in, a, in the human economy, we return them safely uh, back to the biosphere, uh, avoiding any chemicals or any other elements uh, that are not supposed to be back to nature, with the idea of regenerating uh, the biosphere to feed, uh, to feed the people in the future. So basically in nature, when you look at nature, all elements or all living beings, so including us, because we are part of nature, they have a function to, to activate or a specific role to play. And I will give an example now. Um, basically, uh, here you see a human being and you see uh, an ant uh, at, uh, next to the human being icon. And uh, the question, uh, you, you cannot answer me, but maybe Peter can answer. <laughs> uh, the question I often ask is that uh, uh, be between the ant and the humans, all the humans together, so we are 7.6 billion today, uh, who weights uh, the more in terms of uh, tonnage? Or, uh, so who has the highest weight between the humans and uh, the ants? And uh, the answer is the ants. Basically the ants, they weigh more than all 7.6 billion humans on the planet. But the ants are far cleverer than, uh, than humans because they regenerate the ecosystem on which the, they depend on for life. Uh, they make sure that every day, not only they feed themselves, but at the same time, they regenerate their ecosystems so that they can live uh, much longer than, than human beings. Uh, we are not able to do that. And we will have to quickly learn about that, so to quick, quickly learn about how to regenerate uh, the ecosystem on which we depend on, otherwise uh, life uh, will not be possible on the planet anymore. 
So that's, that's the underlying concept behind circular economy. And I believe this is critical to keep in mind because this is not just about recycling and this is everything else but recycling if I want to be a bit extreme. So what's, why this is not about just recycling and what's behind it and how do we start with circular economy? Because you as experts in Africa, uh, you would need to know when do we start? How do we go about it? Uh, how do we think in a circular world? Well, basically, you have to start from the design of the product itself. From the beginning of the design of the product, so here we still have our car uh, analogy, uh, you have to think what are these externalities that this object currently generates? Uh, so we talked about it early on, uh, and, and how do I include and take these into consideration to avoid them in the future. So basically, we need to embed externalities. Uh, and for the car, these externalities are what we said early on, health impact, traffic congestion. We design an object with five seats, but we are often not more than one person in the car. It generates noise, it generates air pollution, uh, it's full of chemical hazards. Um, it's completely inefficient. Uh, it's, uh, it's an object made in a carbon era. It's an object made so the oil and gas industry can uh, sell oil uh, in profusion. So basically, um, this car exists because of the oil industry. And I'm not saying the oil industry is wrong. I'm just saying it has, it has reached a peak uh, in which it's become inacceptable to to live in a, in a petrol-based uh, era. Uh, so we have to find solutions to that because it's easy to say, but uh, it's not easy to find solutions. But what I'm saying here is that um, McKinsey found out that 86% uh, of the oil of the diesel or petrol you put in your car tank never reach the wheels to move the wheels forward. So 86% is being lost in the tubes and pipes of the car before it reaches uh, the wheels. So it's not used to move your car. It's used for anything else but moving your car. So it's really made to waste as much energy as possible uh, because we are in a, in, a, in a civilization where we waste a lot of things. And uh, again, this is I'm talking about the European uh, countries in America uh, who came up with this kind of, of, of model. Uh, it's not always true for Africa, but that's why it is critical to discuss the case of Africa because there is an opportunity for Africa to, to shift to another model uh, because it's not too late for the continent while uh, Europeans will spend the next hundred years sorting out their pollution and uh, the waste that you generated and uh, from, from this kind of economic model. So all these externalities, we need to uh, redesign those objects, taking these externalities into account. So that's the strategy behind circular economy and how to start with. And that's why if this car is made modular, it's, if it's upgradable, evolutive, if it does not lead to waste, but uh, unused resources that we can value because we preserve the car body, we preserve the wheels, we preserve the engine. Today, uh, Volvo, Renault sell brand new cars in their, in their uh, commercial shops with engines made of previously used uh, engines. So, so it's already a reality now and it's called remanufacturing. Uh, we remanufacture past parts as components that have been used, we put them back as new and uh, reuse them as new and with the guarantees, uh, the guarantee of a new engine, it has a six years coverage as if the engine came from virgin materials uh, from the ground. So same thing, same functions, same performance, except that it's coming from past cars. Uh, in terms of definition, um, the circular economy definition is, as I explained earlier, on the left hand side, we have the biosphere and on the right hand side, we have the technosphere. So we split each and every goods, each and every product, each and every um, liquid, uh, gas and everything uh, coming from uh, natural uh, 
biologically made uh, components, so we call them the biological nutrients on one side, and the technical nutrients, so everything that is material, your mobile phone, your computer, your car, on the other side. But the car seats are coming from the biosphere. Okay, and uh, this model is here. The, the economic uh, model behind uh, circular economy is the reuse of vast amount of material. Uh, so we, we design uh, the goods in such a way that we can access the components uh, back again to sell them again. Okay, so it, the reuse in the reuse of, of these components, this is the foundation of the economic growth. If I if I use a, a mobile phone, which is made to be upgradable, which is modular, which is evolutive, and that mobile phone is granted to me for one year uh, because Samsung, Fairphone, uh, Apple calls call back the, the phone after one year, I get a new phone with all my functionalities, with all my contacts, with everything that I, I made. Uh, brand new or second hand that we manufactured or refurbished uh, while the phone that I used last year is being uh, refurbished uh, so that it can be back into the economy uh, within the next three months. So basically Samsung, Fairphone, Apple makes money on the same components or on the same phone again and again. So it's in their interest to design their products so that they last longer. That's the, the, the thinking behind. So it's a restorative economic model by design and intention. We aim at uh, reusing, restore, and it makes business sense to restore, protect, and care for the component we use in that economy. It's based on renewable energy, obviously, we still need to find out how do we work uh, out an economic model on just renewable energies. And obviously this model will have a different shape than it is today because renewable energy are distributive. Everybody can access renewable energy no matter where you are on the planet, sun, wind, ge geothermy, uh, waves, and so on. So it's fully distributive. It's no longer centralized. And therefore, it's no longer concentrated and intense. Therefore, we will have to design products that access a bit of energy in a distributive way wherever we are on the planet. So we might be leading to a low-tech uh, economy. Low-tech doesn't mean uh, less good. Low-tech means accessing energy differently. And Africa, India leads the low-tech revolution as we speak not Europe. So this is another point to say uh, the African Circular Economy Network has identified Africa as the continent that could lead to such a, to such a revolution. Low-tech will be uh, the next uh, technology, not just because people are saying it, because of access to energy which will be very different from today. Uh, it's about rebuilding the natural capital, so the biosphere, because uh, like the ants, we depend on that natural capital. And if we don't have a forest, uh, water streams uh, that are cleaned uh, and, and water sources, uh, we don't have life. So we have to account for natural capital and we have to identify how to preserve best the commons. We move away from harmful chemicals, not just chemicals, but harmful ones. Uh, it was very efficient in, an, in a linear economy, but we, are, we need to move away to effective uh, systems. By effective systems, we mean uh, systems that do not lead to negative externalities, i.e. harmful chemicals destroying our soils and life. And waste is, under, is an undervalued uh, resource, so basically, there's no more waste in a circular economy. That's why when people talk about waste in circular economy, they, they still think linear economy. Uh, in circular economy, there's no such thing as waste. Uh, it's only unused resources. Obviously, I'm, uh, I'm known to be a utopian, but remember that utopia is business as usual. So if you don't break the, your mindset, if you don't think differently, if you don't change, if you still talk waste and waste management, 
you will never innovate in circular economy. This is as simple as that. It's not simple, but this is it. So I will talk about the technosphere, so the part in blue in the right uh, side of my screen, and then I will talk about the biosphere. And when I talk about the technosphere, I will give examples. And when I talk about the biosphere, I will give examples. So we split the economy into uh, these two uh, parts. So the, the technical nutrients, so all the mobile phones, computer, cars, trucks, and bikes, um, they have to be designed to fit. Uh, they have to, to fit into an environment where you see the red line at the bottom. Uh, this is your planet, the biosphere, and they no longer have to uh, head to the landfill. So they have to circle longer and they can be uh, returned, leased, access, shared. And why do we do that? Why do we apply these strategies? Because they are limited. Uh, there, is, there is a limited amount of technical nutrients. The components in your phones, in your computers, in your cars are limited. Therefore, their value will increase and therefore they will, it will no longer make sense to drop them into the landfill next door or drop them at the end of your, your street. So we have to find a way to uh, make sure they last longer into the economic system without crossing the red line at the bottom of my screen. And on the other end, us, the, the, the soon to be 9.7 billion people according to the UN, we are unlimited resources. So we are here to repair, restore, maintain, uh, regenerates uh, when it comes to the biosphere uh, because we are there we are numerous and we are we have energy renewed every day and we we are here to repair so uh, there are lots of talks going on about dropping tax on labor because we are available to repair uh, resources that are becoming scarce and therefore increase tax on resources that are becoming scarce not just for the sake of uh, increasing the tax, but for the sake of protecting these resources. Uh, this is still my RANS icon. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I should have put another icon, but the, the R means RANS, or dollar or euro, whatever, or franc CFA, or whichever uh, your currency is. So the value increase around the labor part and the human part, uh, and the value increase as well at the biosphere uh, part as an outcome of such a model where we protect uh, scarce resources. So goods, goods become durable because it makes business sense. There's no more waste. We are moving away from recycling because the goods are designed to fit. Uh, each part are calculated to be, to play a specific role in the economy and then to get back to, uh, to the manufacturer and labor is valued. So it's a win-win-win model for everybody. Should this be well designed? Obviously, there are a lot of companies that do not follow this model or do not follow these principles because they don't see their, their interest or because they don't want to see that. So, but basically that's the theory of circular economy uh, behind it. Behind. Examples, uh, this is coming from Denmark, uh, where uh, they realize that babies are growing fast and uh, the sizes of the babies in the first six months are changing uh, basically by the day. And therefore it doesn't make sense for families to buy clothes every two weeks, uh, but to access clothes. So this company, Vika, uh, is offering a, a bag made of recycled uh, material uh, and in that bag every every two weeks uh, there is uh, enough clothes to uh, for the baby to to wear and to change regularly and these clothes are just uh, leased every two weeks so that they we maintain the quality of these clothes so that they can be uh, cleaned uh, antibacterial uh, treatments is being applied so that the clothes comes clean again uh, to the next customer. So we don't buy clothes anymore for babies because it doesn't make sense. And we access the clothes and they are returned back to the, to the company so that it can be leased again or rented again. 
And another aspect of circular economy in that specific case is that you are in contact with your customers nearly every day. So you know what your customer expects and you have opportunities to develop your business uh, that way. Uh, another model, which is uh, the washing machine. Uh, obviously, this model is more uh, European model, but we can think about models for, 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 for the African market. Because if we have machines in every, uh, every house, uh, houses in the world, uh, this model will not work as well. So here it's, it's about saying uh, you don't need to buy the machine, you don't need to put your name on the machine. You just need to access some functions of the machine. You need to clean your clothes. If you are a retired couple, maybe you just need uh, to do a wash every week and you don't need all the functionalities on the LCD screen. If you are a young couple uh, you, and you are a geek, uh, you need to have a, a lot of functionalities because you have the baby's clothes to clean, blah, blah, blah. So, so the machine will offer functions and no longer the objects and with standard functions that uh, we, we don't use, we barely use uh, five to 10% of these function functionalities. So basically, and this is the case of meal here, but the machine will uh, be designed to fit what you would need from the machine. So you would need to wash your clothes, you don't need a machine that does everything uh, in the world that you, you will never use. So, so basically they will adapt the design by tracking the usage of the machine. And basically you will pay as you go, you will pay per wash. And this is something that you know very well in Africa. That's why Europeans need to learn from Africans on pay as you go strategies and pay as you go uh, behavior, uh, because this is new to, uh, to market like Europe, America. So again, another advantage that I personally see uh, in Africa, but I'm sure my colleagues at ASEM uh, see that that well that see that well as well. So it's service on demand uh, again with ongoing customer relationship. This is an opportunity to not only offer functions of your machines, but to sell the washing powder, to sell other uh, products uh, that you need uh, besides the machine. So therefore, a new opportunity for meal uh, to to sell uh, stuff. Um, another interesting model, which is a uh, fair phone, uh, which is uh, a phone which, which claims to be repairable. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that we ask you to, to repair the phone. It means that by, and I often make the, the, the difference between Apple, which is a circular economy type one model and fair phone, which is a circular economy type two model. Apple keeps uh, it's phone under license. Uh, when you sell Apple phones in Nigeria or in, uh, in, in Senegal, uh, Apple keeps uh, the access to its phone for itself under license, under license shops. So everything works in a closed loop system. Uh, the phones get back to Apple in uh, California and the robots, I am, I am, uh, dismantle the phone so that all the components remain within Apple. In Fairphone, the model is a bit different. This is what we call circular economy type two. It leads to job creation. It leads to um, uh, 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 an abundance of resources because by sending Fairphone to Nigeria or to Senegal, uh, you will create all kinds of shops to repair the phone because they invite you to dismantle the phone, to open the phone, to upgrade the phone. So all the components are accessible and therefore you increase the stock of materials in your country. Alex, we seem to have lost you. Fairphone or whichever brand I know that in, in Nigeria and in Kenya, there is a lot of PC brands uh, that are very cheap and accessible to, uh, 
to, uh, to the mass population. Uh, whichever the brand, as long as they grant you access to their, to the inside of the device so that it's repairable, it leads to abundance of resources and activities. So that's what you want to attract in your market. Another way to see circular economy is the, what we call the performance economy, where you no longer sell the product, but you, you sell the function, a bit like the washing machine earlier on here. We are, uh, this is the famous uh, example of Philips where they sell lights. Uh, they sell lighting hours, uh, not, not the bulbs itself. Philips is the experts of light systems and bulbs and uh, how to lighten up a place, an airport, uh, a parking, a subway. It's no longer the city to be in charge of that because they are not expert. They are expert in satisfying, increasing satisfaction of citizens, uh, not expert in managing uh, light systems. So Philips manages light systems on your behalf as a city. And therefore, it's in their Philips' interest to have these bulbs last longer, light more, and therefore uh, increase, uh, di diminish their cost uh, because they will be managing the systems. And the, once, once the cars have left the parking lot, once the people have left the subway or the metro uh, station, once people have left the airport hubs, we can dim the light, therefore reduce the cost to, and make savings to the cities, and therefore reduce the CO2 impact. So the city pays Philips according to the drop of CO2 uh, impact, according to the savings. Rate. So, so an interesting model because you pay on performance, not just financial performance, but environmental performance. So now we are done with the technical uh, part of the circular economy. Let's look at the nature or biological nutrient part. So it's all about uh, food and non-food agricultural items. I don't know if you have uh, questions on the technical nutrient. Since we have, uh, we are not limited by Zoom. Maybe I can take one. Sure, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, what's it that's it, so... I suggest you raise your hands uh, before talking. So if there are no questions, I will carry on and we will take the questions uh, later. So the biological cycles, uh, so the left-hand side of the circular economy butterfly diagram, um, we are here consumers. So in the technical sphere, we are users, so we access goods and we return goods. In the biological spheres, we are consumers because it's difficult not to be, not to consume uh, food. So it's all about food and non-food uh, agricultural items. So food, you know, non-food, uh, cotton, uh, uh, and all, all these uh, linen and, and everything that, uh, that uh, we use to make uh, uh, bed cover sheets and, 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 and curtains and, and so on. So, so this is again, you see again the, the, the circular cycle uh, where we could uh, lead to all kinds of gas-based, liquid-based, uh, solid-based uh, operations, uh, access to food for the people, as well as, as leading to, gener to generate uh, energy, uh, biogas, biofuel. Uh, before uh, returning those nutrients back safely into the biosphere to grow the biosphere uh, potential. Okay, so keep in mind that this is about preserving the natural capital uh, to feed uh, 9.7 people in the planet. So consuming bowls become food. So this is food uh, that we consume and we return back into, into the soils. We are moving away from hazardous chemicals, and these nutrients are beneficial. And we are rebuilding the natural capital. Examples: um, We could move, for instance, the fashion industry, which is considered the second most polluting uh, industry in the world, into a very virtuous one, into the one that would feed us in the future. This is the example of uh, Freitag, uh, where the trawler 
uh, is being compostable, biodegradable uh, after uh, two years or, or so of, of use. Uh, the, the, the trouser is made of uh, uh, how do you call it? Du uh, lin. Je sais pas si Muriel peut traduire. Uh, linen from uh, uh, from fields uh, in France. So. It's pure uh, biodegradable uh, material. The, 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 the buttons are screws that you remove when you compost the trouser. So the trouser is, is wearable for one or two years and then you can compost it, uh, leading to regenerating soils for agriculture. So you move, all of a sudden you move from a very polluting uh, industry to a very virtuous one. So, the shifts can happen and it gives hopes for the future because you change the paradigm and you change the way you think and your mindset from something where you see only pollution, only disastrous employment in Bangladesh with people dying and rivers being polluted uh, by the textile industry to all of a sudden a virtuous model that can lead to uh, food, uh, better food systems. Another example is that how about making all the objects uh, we consume biodegradable, compostable, eatable uh, to enrich the soil. If you have in mind that you will sell products with the objective of regenerating the biosphere, then all of a sudden you will find new uh, innovation. And, and I know in Kenya, they are very uh, strong uh, about such innovation. That does the same thing. The, 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 the wine bottle here on the left is protected the same way, but these are mushrooms. These are mushrooms colonies that are grown into a mold and the colony, the, we stop the colony to grow and it takes the shape of a, a packaging um, to protect that bottle. So all of a sudden we sort out the issue of the packaging because it's all made of mushrooms and therefore it can return to the soil safely. The same for this, um, for the, the, the other two objects that we see on the screen. So how about thinking uh, of designing products that are compostable, biodegradable, eatable? Why not? Another approach uh, to the biosphere is to see the clothes as a stock of resources for future activity. Here we lease the gym. Uh, we select the gyms online. We pay for a deposit and we pay five euro per month uh, to access the gym. So basically you wear a gym and you pay for wearing the gym. The gym is not yours. After 12 months, you return the gyms back. And this is not for the sake of leasing the gyms. It's not a gym that has been worn by somebody else before. It's a gym that has been remade, remanufactured, because this company is not thinking about leasing for the sake of leasing. It's thinking stock management, circular economy. I manage my stock of denim, and it's possible for denim today. Uh, I'm not saying it's possible for cotton and, and other materials, but for the time being, it's possible for the jeans. So I manage the stock of jeans for my market, and I distribute jeans. The jeans are being returned. They are being dismantled. I make new jeans from the stock of denim and I can feed my market with my jeans without polluting the rivers in Pakistan or in India, um, and therefore taking into account external, uh, environmental externalities as we discussed before. This is an example from South Africa where um, they use bacteria from uh, urines to create bricks. So bricks made of human uh, origins. So this is maybe a solution to sort out the hugely impactful uh, building uh, activity because out of the waste uh, that we see uh, from the extractive activity and from the dismantling activity, the building uh, activity uh, concrete is uh, total something around uh, 30 to 40% of the total waste uh, we generate on the planet. So the building environment is a huge uh, sector to address and this could be a solution. There are many now solutions from biological bricks being created with the same functionalities as uh, concrete bricks. 
So it does the same job. It does the job. It's just made of here uh, human origins. And since we are 9.7 billion people on the planet, maybe it's good, good news to be more people because there is endless access to such resources. Yellow here is your linear economy, the, how the economy functions today. Uh, so it starts with the extractive activity, as we discussed earlier, uh, extracting finite material. The planet is, has boundaries, the planet is finite, and we need to uh, understand that. Uh, and uh, so all the extractive activities on top, part manufacturing, transformation into into a, into a product that are meant to be sold to you and me via service providers. So here we are uh, consuming everything that is made uh, from the current linear economy. So whether it's from biological or technical origin, we just consume and then therefore we just throw or we bury or we burn uh, all these components, all these materials that we consume. So that's the waste uh, amounts that you see at the bottom of the slide. Now, in circular economy, what we are aiming at is to become users and no longer just consumers. And we will use these uh, technical material on the left, uh, right hand side in blue uh, in, in a maintained strategy to, in order to prolong the life of these, uh, of these uh, elements. Uh, we distribute or we use them. So, these two loops are where the value is higher uh, because we do not uh, waste much component because the idea is to maintain them, to prolong their life. Uh, it's the strategy and this is where we generate most uh, revenues. And in the reuse uh, loop, it's also where we uh, access uh, refurbished or, or uh, goods that have been maintained uh, in the economy and this is if my if my computer my phone or my table is is being maintained uh, all the scratches being fixed and and sold again in the in the economy well it doesn't cost much to ikea, IKEA to resell all the table obviously ikea will move away from uh, the quality of table and the uh, mount table tables that they do today into tables that will last longer because they could sell and resell the table several times, therefore generate more revenue. So the smaller the loop, the higher the value. The, the, the higher, the, the, the larger the loops, the lower the value. So that's why recycling is, is less preferred because in recycling, you destroy uh, material in order to remake uh, those materials. So you, you destroy your PET bottles in fragments to make a PET bottle again. Therefore, you need more energy Therefore, you need uh, to apply more, uh, more energy and more activity in an object that was already existing. In circular economy, we treat the bottle, we clean it so that it can be reused again. And then on the left-hand side, the biological sphere, where we uh, move away from uh, harmful chemicals so that everything we use, uh, we consume here, uh, goes back uh, safely into the soils so that it regenerates the soils uh, for future needs. So the green part is about regenerative cycles and the blue part is about restorative cycle. You see those three arrows uh, in green uh, on the left hand side in the biological cycles. These are what we call the cascading strategy. So Usually I take the, the example of clothes, you have uh, urban clothes on, so usually high quality clothes. Um, the fibers, part of these clothes uh, can, uh, can last uh, two, two years before we, uh, we sell them on the second hand market or we throw them, even worse. But here in circular strategy, you become a service provider where you provide fiber, you provide cotton, you provide you are the cotton service provider. So you use the cotton where the functions are high as a urban clothes. Then you take back the cotton, you sell them into second hand clothes, take them back, you sell them as protective clothes for the building environment, uh, for the building sector. So protective clothes last 10 years, 
take the protective clothes back, you sell them as insulation systems or carpets. Uh, so the fibers are lost in terms of quality of functions, but they can be used in, as carpets or insulation systems for another 20 years in the economy before you move them away from any harmful chemicals so that the cotton uh, and the fibers return back safely to the soil. So all in all, instead of lasting uh, five years as a, as a shirt, it's, it lasts uh, 30 to 40 years as different stages in the, in the economy. So that's an example of regenerative uh, strategy while being used fully in the economic system. And obviously on top, you have the, the large icons, uh, energy icons, so meaning we aim at relying on, on, on renewable energy at all times. These are the, the way you should be thinking about designing the product. I'm not going to go into the details of that because we don't have time this morning. It was just reviewing the basics of circular economy. Um, so product service system, you access the functions of a employment and, and abundance in your market. Design for reuse, you think, um, you think about the component of the product uh, that could be reused. So you call the product back to your factory because you know that one of the components might uh, wear off and therefore you need to replace it. So you can reuse it uh, later on. Modular and standard. Uh, how do you uh, build a computer which is modular so you can recover the keyboard parts, you can recover the screen, you can reuse that uh, later on in another PC because it's made for not lasting longer and prioritize next life. You think of the product that you sell today, but you already have in mind what will be the use uh, of that product in, in another life. So in a circular economy, there's no beginning of life cycles and end of life cycle. It's a perpetuous cycle. Why this is not reci about recycling? Uh, because uh, that's a point which is critical to understand. Um, you have your linear model uh, on top of the screen, take, make, consume waste, and then recycle. So to recycle, we have to go through the waste uh, phase. Therefore, we are still in that mentality of selling a product. That product will lead to what we call waste, and therefore we will recycle. We will drop that bottle of Coca-Cola, just a bit of advertising for them. We will drop that printer, which is very cheap because we make margins on, on the cartridges. Um, but the printer is meant to be waste very soon because it's based on obsolescence. And therefore, you still think linear economy. Uh, the printer will be dismantled, destroyed to make plastic again. Uh, and we need to move away from that aiming at producing waste to uh, recycle. Obviously, the recyclers and the people invest involved in recycling, they want, they need ways to, to, to generate business. And I'm not against that. I'm just saying recycling has a lot of opportunities uh, because of the linear economic patterns. Uh, so recycling has great days ahead. Uh, I'm not worried about recyclers. I'm just saying if you are a pure circular economist, you need to think away from leading to waste in order to recycle. You need to design your product so that it doesn't lead to waste and therefore avoid the recycling cycles uh, loop, which is the less preferred loop in circular economy. So it reduces materials to mesh up fragment. So it's about it's 90% downcycling, only 10% of it is upcycling. Uh, it's a secondary material stream of a linear economy. It's not uh, what we aim at in circular economy. It does not value materials, it does not drive material enhancement. It uses too much energy. You need to destroy that PET bottle to remake the PET bottle, whereas the object already exists. Uh, so I mean, if it's not proper to be reused, the PET bottle, then we need to think about another way to, to make bottles. Uh, it's a good alternative today uh, as a solution. Obviously, we need recycling because there's so much waste uh, being generated. But in circular economy, we avoid waste. And it's not a solution that cope with waste volumes. Uh, in a 7.6 billion people uh, economy, 
the waste volume are so huge that you cannot recycle. I mean, tell me one country, one economy that recycled behind 50% its, uh, its component. Obviously, not even, I think not even aluminium, which is the highest uh, material being, uh, being used, which is 50% uh, if you want to be fully transparent. So recycling is, is okay, but it's not the solution to, for tomorrow. Quickly, but again, I believe we need to spend some quality time on these principles because it's critical for Africa. Uh, we aim at preserving stocks. Uh, Africa is as a huge extractive activity, but how in the future Africa will protect its stock of raw materials, of resources, so maybe you attract some kind of phones and pieces in your market, how you will retain uh, the rare earth component and the component of those pieces and and, and, and mobile phone, so that you increase the stock of material for the needs of your people tomorrow. The way we measure the economy today is again wrong. Uh, we measure it in flows. Uh, this is the GDP, uh, so the water stream going into your bath tubes. Uh, and this is from Walter Stahel uh, example here, it's not nine. So water is coming into the tube, into the bus tube, and uh, you measure that as the wealth uh, coming into your country and uh, waste generated from your country. Uh, but you don't understand the level of that stock. So the water which is in your, in your bus tube is basically the welfare, wealth, knowledge. These are all different stock. It's not only about material stock, it's about stock of knowledge educating people, uh, keeping, preserving the knowledge of dismantling uh, that, like they do in Japan. They, every 10 years, they dismantle uh, traditional temples to remake them because they don't want people to lose the knowledge. This is what we need to do tomorrow. How do we preserve the knowledge of our people? Uh, and this is one of the main stock in circular economy. It's not just about component and material. It's all the stocks that need to be preserved. The issue in our economic system today is that we have no clue what the stock level of our market, of our countries is about, be it in Europe, be it in Africa, be it everywhere. We ignore the level, we don't measure the level of the stock, and we have no clue how much water is outflowing from the bus tube. We have no idea. We have no, this is your waste. This is your pollution. This is uh, entropy. This is the disappearance of wealth and knowledge. These are the people moving, flying to uh, Europe uh, to get a better job, and so on and so forth. So you need to account for all of that. And this is GDP is how we measure the economy uh, today. And uh, the, the level of your stock, the level of your water and your gas tube is how it sh you should be measuring your, your country wealth. This is uh, Peter recognizes streets. Uh, this is a street in the UK, but it's not the point. The point is to say stock is everywhere. Okay, it's it's that phone, uh, that telephone, uh, the street phone, that laser the, the gentleman is wearing, the stones, the concrete, uh, the tarmac, the everything. So stock is everywhere. It's a matter of how do we access that stock again. Few uh, other examples before we open to Q&A. Uh, it's 11.22, so we are on time. I will leave some time for Q&A right after. Um, again, uh, these, these new smartphones that we see popping in and out uh, are interesting models because they are made to be repaired. They are made to be uh, made from conflict-free uh, components. A puzzle phone, which is another phone being produced as we speak, uh, has three components and you can interchange the module, so interesting. Uh, cars um, could also lead to uh, creating jobs in your country if these cars are remanufacturable, modular, if the component can be accessed. So more and more the car manufacturers are designing cars with components that are accessible with the engines that are uh, remade and remanufactured. And the good news is that it leads to job creation. Remanufacturing 
creates far more jobs than uh, manufacturing from virgin material, uh, so selling the car as, as an object. Here, we're manufacturing with programs that call for call back the cars so that they can be dismantled and remade again is creating a lot of jobs. So if you attract these car manufacturers into your countries, please make sure as the government, as the legal, legal people in your countries, make sure that these cars can be dismantled so that you can remake them again. Obviously, I have the Suame cluster from Ghana in mind. You are able to dismantle any car in the world, whether they are dismantable or not. You are able to change mechanical parts in, uh, in uh, digital electronic uh, cars. That's very impressive. Um, but more and more, those objects will be made to be accessible. And this leads to economic activity in your country. And this leads to increasing stock of material in your countries to address the needs of your people. Same in the building uh, environment, which is the most polluting uh, sector ever uh, in terms of uh, waste uh, volumes. Uh, here, buildings are being designed with passports. You see here, there are eight passports on the top, uh, bottom, on the bottom uh, right of the picture. This is my passport that tells me how much wood is in the, in the building, how much concrete, aluminum, you name it. And when we can dismantle them, maybe after 30 years, maybe after 50 years, this is my material bank. I know that from that building, I can access so many tons of wood, aluminum, uh, iron, and you name it. So interesting to build uh, your next building in the flourishing African cities with material passports so that you know what's in there, how to access the windows, how to access uh, the aluminium from that building uh, later. Zimbabwe example, circular economy is also based on the concept of biomimicry. We look at nature and because nature does it best than humans. Remember the ant example. Here, the termite mounts of uh, Zimbabwe, uh, the termites that we find in Zimbabwe, uh, they have one of the best air conditioning systems in the world. And the, an architect looked at the way the termites circulate, the cool hair at night, and removed the hot hair uh, at night so that uh, the termite keeps a very average ambient temperature within the mount. And they did the same in the, the Eastgate uh, Harare uh, Mall. And basically, uh, the cool air enters at night and the hot air uh, exit the building. This is the, the, the steel structure that you see uh, in the building with those chimneys releasing the hot air, like in the Arabic uh, houses uh, we see in Iran, for instance, or non Arabic houses we see in Iran, for instance. But um, this is mechanical systems, uh, and there is no need for energy as much as we see in, in other air conditioning systems. Only 10% of energy is needed compared to any standard eco uh, air conditioning system we see uh, in shopping malls in Johannesburg, uh, Lagos, or, or Dubai. An interesting approach, uh, Taiwanese engineer who developed these screws that after a heating uh, operation, I don't have the details, the screws loses their the past, the threads, and therefore uh, you can dismantle easily uh, the product that you make. So it increases the speed of dismantling objects and therefore uh, accessing components uh, much faster. So an interesting design. Circular uh, South African example, uh, the protein market, animal feed market is huge and is meant to increase dramatically. But how about making, addressing the needs of that animal feed market together with regenerating uh, soils, together with addressing uh, human uh, waste issues? <clears throat> Here you have, uh, you start with the uh, little uh, bean uh, arrow in yellow here, uh, where humans are generating a lot of organic food waste. 
from from those food waste, uh, we uh, we collect the food waste uh, as agroprotein. The food waste uh, is being uh, is the food for the uh, soldier flies that lay eggs in the food. The eggs are growing into larvas. Larvas are eating the food, uh, the, the organic food, increasing, increase their size and their weight by 200 times from the, uh, the original size. And these, they are squeezed to produce oil, so biofuel or feed oil. And the, the meat or the, the remaining of the larvae are uh, protein for uh, poultry, fish, and pigs. Okay, so we reproduce here natural cycles. And on top of that, what's the remains of the food waste after the operation with the soldier flies becomes uh, compost uh, humus for enriching soils. So you address a market need of animal feed, you return to the original uh, way of feeding animals, you produce oil, and you produce compost to regenerate soils. So it's a win-win-win-win model. So an interesting model from, uh, from South Africa here. Uh, circular economy is also based on the concept of industrial ecology. So industrial ecology or industrial symbiosis is basically one resource of somebody. So basically the, the British sugar example where, like I was saying, uh, it's an interesting uh, industrial symbiosis, industrial ecology model. Uh, we often talk about models uh, of industrial ecology where the resource of one factory becomes uh, a valuable resource of another factory, like the Kalemborg uh, model in Denmark, or like the industri industrial symbiosis programs in South Africa, uh, Cape Town, Durban, and Johannesburg have such a program, where we ask companies what waste or what flows, heat, yeast, whatever, do they, do they uh, re reject from their activities so that it can be a, an interesting resource and flows from another factory? Here, what's interesting is that this is an industrial uh, symbiosis model within one factory, okay? So they do it within the factory and there's no outside, uh, there's nothing rejected outside. So basically, the 3.5 million tons enter the factory every year. Only 100 tons exit the factory. And out of these 100 tons, only this mainly canteen, canteen waste. So sugar beets and limestone enter the factory. The stones are split from the soil. The soil becomes topsoil. So the first byproduct that this British sugar company is generating. So it's about 150,000 tons per year <coughs> of topsoil and stone. Not only they are the top producer of topsoil and stones for a decorative garden, you know that uh, English people are very fancy about their garden, um, but, but it's not the point. Not only they generate business out of the topsoil and stones, uh, but they avoid landfill cost because these, these soils would have been uh, thrown into the landfill and it's about 90 euro per ton. So you just imagine how much money you save from this activity on top of uh, generating additional revenue because of the creation of these two byproducts. The next stage is slicing, diffusion, uh, pulp press and pelleting. And the pellets goes to animal feed, so another byproduct uh, generating revenues. Next uh, stage is purification, leading to lime. And British Sugar is the top producer of certified lime in the UK, so another interesting byproduct. Next stage, evaporation, and so on, uh, leading to oh, by the way, sugar. This is 20,000 tons per year. Next stage, crystallization, leading to betanin, raffinate, uh, feed and uh, treatment for fish, for sheep, uh, bioethanol, so energy, uh, venous and concentrated yeast protein for animal feed. Uh, they, all, they have also contacted air liquid uh, because obviously the chimneys are releasing CO2. 
uh, air liquid uh, capture the CO2 outside of the chimney and uh, transform it into liquid CO2 for the refrigeration business, another byproduct. The heat coming out of this factory is, heads to uh, the tomato production. So they produce tomato and they are the top tomato producer in the UK, uh, a sugar factory. And lastly, they generate uh, fuel and electricity. Uh, well, fuel is an input, sorry. So they generate electricity. So they feed the grid uh, with electricity produce. So very interesting uh, activity because nothing is wasted. Everything is being valued and leading to uh, 12 uh, byproducts besides uh, sugar. Some example from Africa that I used uh, last week at the OECD uh, conference uh, and Muriel was there as well. Uh, I just mentioned the industrial symbiosis uh, program um, in South Africa where we identify resources of companies to be used by other companies. Uh, Sanergy in Kenya where they uh, franchise sanitation systems so like a mini business where there is the separation of uh, human, uh, uh, human, human waste. Human waste which is being uh, treated to uh, generate compost uh, leading to food or leading to uh, energy. So from the sanitation activity, feeding the people through regenerating the soils or uh, re generating electricity. So a very interesting model. Uh, another model which, which could lead to a new kind of job, food and energy, is the Wakanda project, city project in Rwanda, uh, a full-fledged uh, green city where waste will be non-existent. Another uh, pro city project in Nigeria, uh, the biomimicry Abuja uh, city, where they will influence themselves from nature to create the next city and generate new kinds of jobs. In Ivory Coast, uh, Lono, uh, one of our members in Ivory Coast, uh, uh, educating people and uh, sorting and de defining and designing solutions in permaculture and waste valorization. Uh, there is uh, an ongoing uh, Pan-African program uh, through PACE, the platform for accelerating circular economy, to address the issue of electronic waste. So it's a urban mining activity which is being tested in Nigeria as we speak in order to recover uh, electronic components. And lastly, Umgibe in South Africa, mainly in the peri-urban area of South Africa, i.e. The, the poor areas of South Africa, where there's not enough space to have a full-fledged field to grow food. So it's a hanging system where we grow salads and all kinds of vegetables that require not much water, that doesn't require space, and we can feed people uh, through this uh, system. So uh, here, some interesting solution for, uh, for Africa. Um, so it's all in all, it's a new economic model. Uh, it's, it's about developing and addressing Okay, uh, developing uh, developing new new forms of uh, of uh, businesses uh, in uh, in uh, in an economic system that makes sense. Why Africa? Uh, basically, because Africa you understand better uh, than than Europeans or, or Americans of how to recover uh, resources, which is being abused because it was called the. Uh, uh, the economy of scarcity or the economy where scarcity was everywhere and uh, you had to uh, it, the survival economy where you had to recover that's why it's very uh, informal uh, in the informal sectors today in africa but basically it's an opportunity to not forget uh, all the good knowledge that you had uh, through traditional knowledge or past uh, behavior to recover the unused resources uh, that's identified within your market. It's about designing a new economic model so Africa could lead that economic model uh, tomorrow. So that's very interesting. 
and it's about collaborating. So you know better than anybody else on the planet how to collaborate within within individuals and within people. You, you, you speak in the streets, which is not the case in Europe. You talk to each other, uh, whether, whether you know the people or not. So you know how to collaborate and to, um, to work together to solve solutions. So there is a lot of hope for Africa through a kind of circular economic model, not necessarily the one proposed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but a model that could lead to uh, to regenerate your system, your ecosystems, and to uh, to lead to abundance of resources that that need, that is needed to address the needs of the of the people in Africa. Opening the debate now. Uh, any questions on the presentation or discussing uh, how you see circular economy play a role in the continent? Thank you, Alex, very much for your presentation. Um, what is the view of the common person on use of the biological bricks? Using sterilized or diluted urine for irrigation is not popular for some African countries. Okay. I, I, I don't think we could have, we couldn't see that question. Um, can you repeat yeah. the question? It's what is the view of the common person on use of biological bricks? Uh, it was about the ex example of uh, the, the South African uh, professors who found a way to create bricks from uh, human uh, origin. Um, sterilized or diluted urine for irrigation is not popular for some African countries. Well, it, Raymond is the same. Uh, basically, these bricks are made in South Africa or the the process has been developed at the University of Cape Town by some three, uh, one professor and two students from what I could see uh, in the article. I'm not saying uh, this is just a solution for Africa. This, this has been developed in South Africa and can be sold uh, anywhere in the world. Um, I'm just saying this is an innovation made in, Afri in the African soil. Uh, obviously, uh, even in my country of origin, uh, there might be some issue uh, uh, using uh, bricks, uh, biological bricks, but it's also a matter of how do you sell those bricks. And uh, I know that uh, one of our colleagues in Durban is making bricks out of uh, uh, waste, uh, building waste. And those bricks have the same functions uh, as uh, bricks coming from virgin metal. So, it's also a matter of marketing the, the new product and making sense of it. Uh, obviously, I, I assume uh, the biological bricks will not come with uh, everything that we can think of um, uh, right now, but it's also a matter of changing mentalities and, and seeing the bricks as being brick, uh, uh, no matter where it's coming from. So. Uh, us as customers, we have to change our mindset, but I understand the cultural issues and uh, I might have the same issue uh, myself, so so it's an open open, open answer, really. Um, Alex, there's a question come through from Joe. Can you see it on the chat screen? Yeah, recycling currently provides livelihood opportunities for 20 million informal workers across the world. Do you see a place for them earlier in the value chain, pre-waste, given we want to avoid waste altogether? Mm. Well, recyclers around the world, whether they come from formal or informal industry, they, it's like mining companies and miners. Uh, they are material experts. They, they know better than anyone uh, what material could lead to what use and uh, what component could lead to what uh, what usage so they should be seen in the value chain as our experts in material and therefore uh, the value of these uh, these informal sectors uh, collecting our waste today could be increased in a circular economy where we consider what they collect as highly valuable so if you embed them into the value chain as material experts, obviously uh, their situation will, uh, will be uh, improved and enhanced in, the, in, the, in an economy that preserves uh, 
that sees value in that way. So, so obviously the future of, of these people, whether they are from informal or formal uh, sectors, um, they collect our waste and tomorrow they will be uh, material experts. They need to be supported and it needs to be, they need to be embedded into some kind of value chain here, obviously, and supported, but that could be a great approach to these 20 million people in the informal sector. And, and, and I'm sure, Joe, when you ask your question, you've noticed that in your country, I saw that in South Africa, but in your country, uh, the informal sector is being uh, looked at uh, in a different eyes. And I know some people as well uh, studying in, in the informal sectors. Uh, I had some students from the University of Cape Town uh, doing their thesis on informal sectors because they see value from, from that sector. So obviously, uh, value is coming their way and they are not being treated the same way as they do. We have 10 more minutes. We have um, Tash has got his hand or got their hand up. Tash, would you like to ask the, your question? Oh, yes. Hello, everyone. This is Dean from Uganda. Ah, hello, Dean. Yes. Uh, now, uh, what I notice in uh, such like Colome from my experience is that uh, utilization, for example, for the waste, you need to determine, first of all, people need to see the benefits. And mainly, if you are in the, the entrepreneurship, you need to see the, the economic benefits. Then also, you need to look at the best route for the waste if you are to utilize it. Where do the, does this waste uh, benefit more in terms of environment, economic, and social. So you need to develop a business case as well as the social and, uh, and, and environmental case for all that. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, exactly. I mean, the small example I gave from Kenya, uh, Sanergy, there is waste. I mean, again, human waste, but... Uh, we have a, a poor peri-urban area outside of Nairobi and all of a sudden we, 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 we manage uh, sanitation services as a franchise. We create unemployment and people managing those 10 sanitation blocks. Uh, there is a service provided, a clinic service provided, hygienic service provided. So there is no more diseases around these issues. Uh, the waste is, is valued, so there is an economic uh, opportunity there. And the waste is being transformed into energy and uh, rich soil to feed the people. So, so it's all a matter of seeing the economy differently. And there is nothing new uh, as being you in Africa. Uh, this is something that you used to do, but it needs to be uh, to increase in terms of professionalism and uh, uh, being spread uh, across uh, all economies and being spread across economies outside of Africa as well. So here you have op an opportunity as well to sell these ideas and these concepts outside of the continent as well because, because you know better than, than anybody else uh, how, how you used to survive in the past years in a scarce uh, model and how to avoid that. So how to create some kind of abundance. So I agree that uh, you need to see the economic potential, but by just shifting some of the model, you all of a sudden you can increase the value of what is considered waste today. It's, it's easier said than done, obviously, but uh, uh, the idea is there to think differently, to, to, to test and to, to, see, uh, to see models uh, Upside Can you share any example you know of supportive policy in Africa? Doesn't necessarily have to be circular economy policy, but policy that organizations have been able to use to their advantage in transitioning to more circular models. Um, I don't have all the policies in mind. I know that there are new laws in South Africa uh, that are leading to uh, increase uh, extended producer responsibility. So the producer, the manufacturers are being asked to consider the waste that they are generating and take responsibility for that waste. Um, there are laws, there are 
laws in, uh, I mean, the famous one is Rwanda, but there are about, if I'm not wrong, uh, between five and 10 countries, which has banned plastic bags uh, and plastic components. So interesting, um, interesting laws that are shifting uh, the economic interest to opportunities elsewhere using different uh, ways of carrying stuff. Um, and also there is also this famous uh, decision from Rwanda uh, and now I believe Kenya and other countries, uh, Ghana is thinking about it and to say stop uh, for, from the waste uh, generated from, uh, shifted from America or Europe. So you are saying stop from receiving such a waste uh, and these countries uh, are now forced to, to think differently. So the same for, for, for your countries where since your country is saying stop from outside, uh, external, ex outside of the continent's countries shifting waste to your continent, uh, it means that there will be also opportunities within your countries uh, because the government will also say we need to revalue those uh, those resources that are undervalued today so there will be a shift in tax a shift in value of components and goods so the first opportunity i can think of uh, joe would be electronic waste it seems that it's getting there there's also a plastic uh, plastic waste uh, tender currently in nigeria and there is also the electronic waste program in Nigeria, there is a platform in, uh, in Ghana uh, identifying uh, unused resources as well. Our colleagues from ASEN Ghana are working on. So the things are changing fast and uh, value is being shifting uh, to these uh, unused resources. Alice, we've got a few people commenting on the chat screen, which is very helpful. Um, so if you want to make any comments to what's being written there. So maybe, yeah, Peter from Rwanda can share. Uh, can, can, you, can you take the mic, Peter, and uh, share some experience from uh, Rwanda? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm so sorry I came in late. Uh, I had planned to come earlier, but um, I have other engagements that I, I, was, I wasn't uh, able to join. So to be honest, I just came in when you are concluding your uh, your presentation and sharing uh, the training material, but I hope that there will be an opportunity for me to follow later if it is recorded. And that will be great for me to to understand uh, the perspective and what you've been discussing. But in terms of uh, circular economy, I think in Rwanda we, uh, for the past almost I can say 15, uh, 10 years, uh, there has been a lot of uh, on the policy front. Uh, uh, and in terms of uh, government taking initiatives uh, to recycle, uh, to ban plastics, and um, also to uh, have demonstration projects in areas of waste management, uh, from collection to uh, managing landfill and all that, in, 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 that's in waste management, but also in terms of characterization of waste, in terms of uh, E-West versus uh, Green West. Uh, we have examples of where now um, uh, rice husks are being used in terms of uh, coming up with uh, bricks for construction industry. Uh, we have areas in where uh, recycled plastic waste is being reused into other products uh, which are used in the industry. We have almost uh, now coming to 20 companies uh, doing uh, plastic waste recycling in the country. So mm -hmm. there are a number of uh, initiatives that I can share with uh, other members of, of this forum uh, later on, uh, because I really, uh, it will be good to understand uh, countries which are participating here, what do they really want to, have, to learn maybe from our experience as Rwanda. I think we have done a good job in terms of uh, uh, um, managing waste but also in terms of circular economy but specifically on, on waste management uh, um, and maybe i would also love to share to get some experiences from other countries uh, on where they are in terms of managing waste or other circular economy initiatives from other african countries uh, which maybe we can learn from other countries because 
this is all about uh, it's a um, it's a new field that we can share with other countries and we can also learn from other countries. Thank you. Excellent. Many thanks, uh, Peter. That's helpful. I think it was Joe um, Alex asking if Dean could be could expand a little bit on um, the specifics around the new environmental law providing for stakeholders to implement circular economy in their systems. Dean, are you able to expand a little bit on that? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, now, this is uh, uh, what it points out, that the players have to promote such an economy by maximizing production efficiency to conserve the use of the environment and natural resources and to control the generation of waste to the greatest extent possible. Uh, of course, they are, that is through uh, use of products, uh, proper disposal of uh, saturated resources, and uh, promoting multi and the intersectorial approach. That is uh, what it promotes exactly. Thanks for your time and uh, have a great day further. Bye-bye.